Welcome to Blue Talks. I do want to say welcome, Kate, to this Blue Talks interview. I have had the pleasure of meeting you before, but I'm just going to be completely honest. I just remember loving you oh so much, but I don't remember a whole lot about what you do, which is really cool because now I get to see the new version of you and not just the little bits that I, I do remember. Because I do remember we met about a year ago and my life was kind of chaos in most areas at that point. So there wasn't really a whole lot going in. <laughs> and I would have been living in a van at that point. I, and I would have been, her, yes. yeah. And I wouldn't have even been in Scotland. So lots has changed for both of us now. Exactly. So now I'm, I'm just extra excited and extra curious to know, well, who is Kate today? Not who was Kate last year, what she was doing. No. How have you grown since last year? There's this new version of you. Let's get to know that. So first off, I want to ask you the same question that I do in the Blue Talks Amplifier Message Show, which I just find so fun because I get to learn about you and your values and your business and how it all relates. So if you're ready, then I want to ask you, uh, what three words, just three, would you love other people to use to describe you? And I'm actually going to write this down, even though I don't have my notebook. <laughs> Grab another one. Um, that's a great question, first of all. Uh, and, and actually interesting, um, tiny backstory, but I, uh, I asked my friends this a few years ago, like, um, probably about three or four years ago, I asked uh, a whole bunch of my friends to describe me with three words so that I could have an understanding of what they saw me as. And one Aww. of the things that came back was so shocking. And, uh, it, it came back regularly that people would have something like bubbly or friendly or energetic. And yeah. I just didn't like perceive myself that way. I just did not perceive myself as bubbly, but it kept coming back. <laughs> oh, I did. That's why we connected. I was like, yeah, you're my kind of people. Yeah. And so it's yeah. interesting. So um, I would say, yeah, like a uh, cheerful or bubbly is something that I okay. actually I really like that people uh, would get from me or, or friendliness, you know, um, I'm from a small town. So I, I would say something in that category. I definitely yeah. love people to think of me as. Um Another one would be um, like wise or like intuitively Ooh. intelligent, that type of okay. grounded um, wisdom or when people mm. call me soul, you know, I, I love that. I love being known that way as well. Yeah. Um, and I would also say loving. Um, it's something I really, Aww. you know, so sentimental, <laughs> really starting on a feeling note, but I can't do that. Um, I can't do the surface level really at all anyway. No like loving or, or deep or wise these these types of qualities are definitely what I what I like to have people know me as if they know the real me that's what they'll say as well exactly well for those who like personality types mine in the the Myers-Briggs version is an ENFJ so I'm extroverted oh. intuitive <laughs> feeling and judging but not in like the typical judging kind of way yes. I haven't quite mastered the difference between p and the j yet kind of working on that part but i know that part of my personality means that we pick up on the subtleties of the human behind the masks and the armor more easily than many of the other types it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen it just means it's just easier and more natural for us so i love that you said this is the deeper version of me because that's where i want to go in all of my interviews it's not just about the work that you do. It's who is the human being behind the work, behind the message, behind the business. Absolutely. And you know, it's so funny. <laughs> I just did um, teach the Myers-Briggs uh, types to did my you? Energetics course literally just a couple weeks ago, Laura. It's so funny okay. um, because I'm fascinated by the same concept you brought up. I'm an INFJ. <laughs> Um, and oh, no wonder we get along so much. You're my favorite. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I noticed that uh, between the J and the P doesn't make a huge difference, but who oh. takes my course, people who identify as empaths or who are highly sensitive and people who are drawn to this work are generally NFs, people who are yes. intuitive, people who are feeling, because that 
makes total sense. I know how other people, you know, slip in and out, you know, so there's not, there's not that, oh, uh, you know, broad stroke. I only work with these people, but it was yeah. really curious to see how many were ENFJ, INFJ, ENFP, INFP. Yeah. You have this similar way of perceiving, like of taking in the world as well. Yeah. And the difference between uh, J and P um, is also, I mean, it's, it's really, I think also very relevant to just how you're uh, dealing with stress at that time in your life and how you intake information. So it, it's really, I think that's one that for many people could change, but depending on how they, it's more on how they intake information. So, yeah. I love that. <laughs> one of my intuitive uh, superpowers is that I can read eyes. And so literally people can give me a snapshot of a random person. And I've had people cut out like just this part of somebody and give it to me. And they're like, who is this person? And I go right to personality types because it's, it's so consistent that I can have that conversation where most people get the gist of what I'm talking about. And so I love that you brought up that the the NFs tend to be the ones that come to you, but not always. Yes. And what I see in the eye reading is your, your personality type is your default. There's so much room for growth. So just because I'm an extrovert doesn't mean that I can't learn introverted tendency tendencies. Absolutely. That's just my default state. So then like my job as an extrovert is to learn throughout my life, how to be okay with myself. It's very hard. Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't mean that we're all feeling all the time. We also think, exactly. you know, there has to be that. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's like the spreadsheets all over the place. Like I'm very intuitive, but yet I've got my spreadsheets. Everything is laid out, data, science. Oh yeah. It's, it's the yin and the yang, the two sides. I love it. Yeah. I was so talking, Kate, talking about eye reading like an hour ago, Laura. So we're already on a very good intuitive start here. Synchronicities everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Insert sparkles. Exactly. I do want to highlight that your words of cheerful, wise, and loving, they are more unique than many people's words. Many people love to be described as authentic, as kind, as creative. But I love how you take those elements and yet you you deepen them in a more specific and more focused kind of way. Because <laughs> the loving part, you're like, yeah, I'm authentic in my lovingness. How can I love you without being authentic? How can I be wise without that? Absolutely. How can I be wise without the creativity? Right? It's it's there, but it's subtle. And I love the subtleties. <laughs> There's no option with me really. So it's interesting to know that, that it's different. Um, and yeah, I, words do mean a lot to me. So I guess it's, it's also not surprising to me that I'd be searching, swimming around for those just, just more accurate, a little bit more, you know, it's this, yes. this kind of hungry pursuit of self-knowledge that gets me continuing to chase like words and their meaning and their significance. And yeah, being very specific, clearly, as you noted. <laughs> Oh, yes. Self-awareness. I, I just wrote this this morning since we were talking oh, so many synchronicities. <laughs> I just wrote this morning that self-awareness is a huge foundation, a huge starting point to any sort of success or high performance. And in the work that I do with entrepreneurs telling their stories better, without that piece, you're just kind of going through the movements. So exactly. it's like who's really story? work you know yourself whose story is it then truly exactly right? yeah yeah it's so it's so pivotal the I mean the empath energetics no surprise has a lot to yeah. do with self-awareness as well because a lot of the reason that highly sensitive folk and empaths struggle with their high performance which also is an endlessly fascinating I have oh like, I know habits book on my night table as we speak <laughs> nice yeah. okay yeah, and but a, a lot of the reason that I built that program um, for intuition development and energetic understanding is really like self awareness. Because if you are blaming other people for your lack of energetic strength, yeah. you are then going into this place where you feel like the world is against you, or you feel like you're too sensitive, or that you can't handle anything. When it's actually just a, a skill of mm -hmm. perception and sensitivity is actually just this um, tool. You know, it's just one one sense perception that we have uh, yeah. and you know I, I was really I was you know the stuff that frustrates you is the stuff you're meant to make a change with you know you know that saying yeah it just so no, we're gonna me. go with this really <laughs> 
that was one of the questions I didn't write down yet. I was like, for some reason, all of these questions are popping in my head and I just needed to chuck it in a spreadsheet. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so now I'm like, I want to yeah. know these things. <laughs> yeah. But let, let's narrow in just a little bit on certain area of your self-awareness. Mm-hmm. So this, this is about your business. We want to learn about that too. How does self-awareness play a role doing the work that you do? And of course, now you have to tell us the work that you do. Of course. <laughs> um, well, self-awareness was the reason I even got into the work that I do now, because yes. um, the reason I got into healing work, uh, which is a very large you know, category, yes. truly. Uh, but the reason I got into it was because I was in a really dark time in my life and I kept having these dreams um, of this like goat showing me a retreat property and where I would be living and doing this healing work. And I was like, well, that's a really nice thought that takes me away from the darkness of the day. And you know, yes, <laughs> in a very morbid, you know, kind of sense. And then I found myself having this dream so often. And then I'd be thinking about it on the subway. I'd be like, oh, this, you know, I'm, I'm having a lot of hard feelings and my, my brain would just go to this nice place. Then I realized, is that my dream in life? Is this perhaps what, you know, in, in this, so obvious, it just sort of struck me one day, like, you know, Apple hitting Newton's head. Oh, maybe, maybe this is just what I want in my life. And so, you know, it was really self-awareness understanding that this was a dream of mine that I had mm-hmm. had yet to realize, which was the thing causing me so much soul pain and soul loss and, emotional disruption um, at that time in my life. And then through the pursuit of all these different healing avenues, obviously every time you take a new body of, of understanding of like a, a healing tool in, you are applying that lens to yourself first. So I have done many things. Um, I'm an aromatherapist, a reflexologist, an advanced Thai yoga massage practitioner, restorative yin yoga. I've done Indian head massage, um, I've done marma points, like extra advanced things. I'm a hypnotherapist now and a shamanic practitioner, and I've done over 4,000 psychic readings. So wow, it did not have any self-awareness. I think I'd be on the floor. <laughs> the only thing in there that I haven't heard of is the marma points. Yeah. Marma what are those? Yeah. It's like, it's like a part of Vedic. It's, so it's like um, a part of an Ayurvedic system of uh, it's energy oh. points. It's like meridian. Okay, yeah. Uh, you know, similar to reflexology and it's just, um, yeah, just more energy points. I think I'm just fascinated by all the different ways we've tried to understand energy over the years and how it's yeah. our body. So yeah, it's another one of those. So happy to give you another rabbit hole to uh, delve into. Oh yeah. yeah. There are rabbit holes <laughs> everywhere. And then I spend most of my time like, oh, this is cool. This is cool. Lately, I've been watching a documentary series or docu-series on Netflix about uh, near death experiences and everything involved with that. And so there's there's this scientific community that is starting to question life beyond the physical life. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> bring in the data, have the conversations, see all of the weird and crazy experiences that some of us have had, many of us have had. Absolutely. And it's yeah. Like- it's not happenstance and it's, you know, it's fascinating actually in, in the shamanic world, um, often those NDEs, those near death experiences are um, considered shamanic initiations. And there's a number of things that are considered shamanic initiations, but it makes total sense, right? Because yeah. from the spirit lens, what's happening and I'm, I'm totally a, a science and logic brain as well. Oh, yeah, like yeah. Total. I think we're on the same nerd. You're like, how do they, <laughs> I just, I yeah. need to find how everything connects because yeah. there are a few people that know how to connect. Yes, everybody can find the puzzle pieces, but few can put them together. That's what I love. Yeah. Yeah, And you know, I'm, I'm so touched clients say that to me all the time. That's why they like working with me because I'll drill it Mm -hmm. down. I'll find the core. They don't waste the time going in circles the way I went in circles for many years uh, in the attempt to figure it all out. Um, But the near death experiences, I think what's so fascinating is um, they are linked to this shamanic initiation because when you think about it, it's like your brain is logging off and you're in that total limbo state. At some point you're experiencing such a heavy soul trauma and soul loss um, associated with that, that your, your body separates from your spirit. Cause your spirit's like, we got to get out of here. Something crazy is going to happen, right? This is real dangerous and your spirit leaves your body. And so you have that experience of separation from self, yeah. which allows you to understand then human suffering and soul loss on, on a very deep level. You come back to your body and then you're capable 
of accessing this non-ordinary realm in a flash more easily than your average person. And there's also a number of other experiences that aren't maybe considered near death, but have that similar quality. So when I was a kid, I had uh, seizures. And so that's another shamanic initiation is I had these absence seizures where my brain would just log off, restart, and I had no control over it. It happened many times a day. And it was from stress, from great levels of stress. And so this soul loss, it was like I was leaving. I had no control. It was like I abandoned myself. My spirit just abandoned me and then would flood back into my body, sometimes without even my awareness. So I joke that that's what makes it so easy for me to go off now and actually bring bring back messages this time. (laughs) Whereas as a kid, you were just scared because it's, you know, something you know, is, is uh, out of your control and, and what a, what a, that's similar to what a near death experience feels like for people. So, so many questions there, but I want to start with the, uh, the seizures just yeah. because it, it relates to a friend of mine. I remember her grade 12 year, she had more seizures in that one year than she did the rest of her life combined. Mm-hmm. And so now I want to know, I wonder if she was having a similar experience and just didn't have the words to articulate it. Mm-hmm. Well, she absolutely no. does. It's just whether or not it's ever going to get put into that framework for her in her life, right? It became exactly. so invaluable to me to see, um, you know, my experiences this way, because later on in life, when I was going through a really tough time emotionally, like I was mentioning, uh, my default was to leave, like to shut off. And so I would detach completely, you know, we know it now in psychology terms as depersonalization or derealization, yes. wandering down the street. Like, it's a very scary thing. You just would be like, how did you here? Oh, this is bizarre. And I'm so orderly and in control. And I was so cautious and I was so, you know, I had really was so attentive to everything, hypervigilant, I would say at that time that for me, the long <laughs> off, I was like, oh no, something's broken in Kate brain. You know, there is something yeah. wrong. And, but that again, it was like this training for, Hey, it's not actually as scary as you think when you leave. Uh, it, it's not saying that you're gone forever and that that constant mm. back to self is now actually how I've, I think I have a really good level of presence and and I don't really drift off that same way anymore because I feel so comfortable now in this, this earth Aww. body. Yeah. yeah. It, it's from collecting all these soul parts. I've like brought so many aspects of myself back Ooh. to myself. We're, soul we're, parts. Oh, yes. This is part <laughs> of the shamanic understanding is that when harshness happens to us or we interpret harshness, you know, it's mm-hmm. exceptions, everything, right, Laura? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> But when we interpret something really scary um, or painful to have happened to us, we it's like one part of us, our true nature leaves just for safekeeping, you know, and, mm-hmm. and it could be from anything. And sometimes it's like, you know, you drop your ice cream as a kid and somehow it, it leaves you forever, you know, and other times it's like something intense, like you get into a car accident, you know, this is a typical or surgeries, right? When your body yeah. goes under anesthesia, if you don't warn your body first, you know, and your soul, your soul's like, what's up? Oh, yeah, I never so thought about that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I wish someone had told me that before I got my wisdom teeth out. You know, I should really just be like, Hey, just so you know, I'm doing this on purpose. <laughs> we're we're going to leave on purpose this time. <laughs> Please come back. Yeah. We're all going to return back. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Meet back at the center. Meet back at the <laughs> muster station. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it really is the beautiful journey of going through life though, because I, I don't think we're ever fully complete, complete, you know, mm. um, there's always like more of us to be able to like bring up and self-express and bring back to ourselves. And then as life goes on, you know, there's going to be things that come my way that might challenge that and that you have to call back then aspects of myself and how beautiful it is to give everyone the tools to do that. And, and mm. since the beginning of time, we just haven't talked about it in that context for quite a while. Yes. So you, you mentioned seizures and you mentioned healing and we all know that healing is this broad topic. It's like wellness. Well, there are like 50,000 things under that. Does, does this story of your seizures, does that play a a key role in why you do the healing work? Yeah, I would say, um, it does in the, you know, having an early on, cause that was during my preteen years, having an early on experience of that lack of control and that feeling of, um, you know, fear, fear, truly concern for my well being. Um, it incited me to care about, you know, how my brain works and uh, what suffering is. But actually, way before that, and probably more importantly, I'd say, 
especially as, as such a caring or, you know, loving person that, um, my mother also uh, has multiple sclerosis. And I think most children of parents who are dealing with some sort of longstanding condition resonate with this feeling of, oh my God, I just wish I knew the solution to help my mom feel better. Right. And how simple yes. and pure that is, uh, that really, I think actually has a lot more to do with it. And then of course, yes. the other aspect was out of great need. I was very hurt by the world. I was very, you know, I was in a really dark place, like I said, so that it was out of necessity to get myself out of this, this hole, uh, this, you know, this depth that felt scary to get comfortable yeah. waiting in the depth of the ocean waters, as I, as I call them, you know, the bottom of the ocean where it's like very scary stuff goes on. You know, yes. I love that zone now, but I did not love that zone at the time. I was not ready to feel all the discomfort that comes with that. And through healing, mm -hmm. of course, um, you're up against it. You soothe it. You're up against it. You soothe it. And eventually they settle out, you know, it's truly, mm -hmm. truly such a beautiful path. And uh, it's emotional actually to think about, uh, you know, when I put all this in context uh, to, to look at it, like what a beautiful journey. Um, and I'm only 31. <laughs> so I'm like, I get so oh, much really? light. Yeah. <laughs> Your energy doesn't say 31. <laughs> no, you know, I, no. I was just at the gym the other day and this girl in the sauna told me I look so much younger than I am. And I was so flattered because I'm used to everyone telling me I'm such an old soul that I always feel like I'm like 80 oh. years old. <laughs> yeah. I oh, saw so a cartoon about that this morning. It was somebody's 40th birthday and they're like, happy birthday. You're only as old as you feel. And he's like, oh, that means I'm 85. Yeah. 85 is normally what I say in that joke, actually. I, I've, yes. I've Benjamin buttoned myself down to 80. <laughs> nice. Soul level 80. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank so you. So then can you describe to us what your version and expression of healing is? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a good question because uh, truly like for many years, uh, how it's worked is that people will come to me to do one-to-one -one sessions and say, just give me whatever you got. They're not actually coming to me for a specific thing. And this is so strange because honestly, this happened way before I was ready for people to treat me that way. I was like, book with me what you want. You know, you want time massage, you want aromatherapy, you want reflex, you want energy, you want, you know, and people will be like, I just like talking to you. You help me think about my stuff. And I go, well, I'm not trained in talking to people. <laughs> trained in wisdom giving that's not really a thing and then I realized it is a thing actually that's that's what intuitive totally is. yeah it's definitely a thing and uh, so over time of course uh and and with the pandemic so beautiful actually the pandemic came in and interrupted sideswiped my whole I had a in-person location where I was doing all this body work yeah. and then I realized actually a skill that I do have that can translate to the online world is what people were already asking me for this oracle work and so I shifted okay. I was working part-time for another business, um, a uh, weight loss business, actually coaching. And I was like, yes. I get out of this because I know my work can do so much more and so much, you know, deeper, deeper layers can be helped with people that then I switched it into, I was doing virtual assistant things, just trying to like, how could I shift out of, you know, owing my time to some company and bringing it back to myself. And then through that, through this business healing and getting confidence, um, I was able to then start my YouTube channel doing Oracle work at the same time. And in that time, I realized, uh, yeah, that's a skill that was untapped. And I started doing all these psychic readings throughout the pandemic, proving to myself I could trust my intuition. And then I built this intuition program. So healing to me works like, you know, being receptive to what spirit wants for me. So now actually in my journey, I just did uh, the talk at Cambridge University with Blue Talks this last summer. On, thank you. Um, on the power of receptive brain states in healing community, Ooh. because everything I do, hypnotherapy, all about being receptive, receiving things in your subconscious mind that benefit you to then have your reactions and your conscious behaviors become influenced by that subconscious like belief shift, right? Shamanic yeah. healing, you need to be receptive. I need to be receptive as the shamanic practitioner to be able to leave this world comfortably, get gifts from the non-ordinary, bring them back. You've got to then be receiving, you know, in a, in a relaxed brain state in order to have that. When I used to do body work, you, you don't actually relax until you get your mind and nervous system into that receptive state. I'm so mm. passionate about the nervous system in its, and its role in our healing, obviously. Me <laughs> you know, too. And ignore the nervous system and its influence. And then also with Oracle and intuitive work and with psychic work, 
like I have to be in a receptive state in my brain to not influence it with my interruptions, my criticism, my influence of logic versus intuition, right? And and allow thing to fall where it needs to allow my brain to access things as it's capable of doing. So healing to me looks like receptivity. Yes. Yes. 100%. Yes. I can't say it enough. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that, I mean, that's where I'm at currently. And then I would also say healing also looks like tuning into your own, like full soul self-expression. So Mm. now the other side of me is like pursuing art and my music. And this is like the next stage of my evolution is of course, continuing to serve clients and also serving myself in this higher need way of my own sense-based expression, my creative expression. That's where I was going to go next. That is my question oh, number two. It's really? like, <laughs> what is something that people, that most people don't know about you? And you did mention <laughs> some of those hobbies you're doing on the side. So whatever you want, you can go there, or go somewhere else. What's something that yeah. most people don't know about you? Most people don't know about me that I was a burlesque performer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that would um, be so much fun. It is fun. Um, And it's a beautiful aspect of my journey as well, because um, coming into the feminine, which of course is linked to receptivity. Can we say it louder in the back, right? It's Mm -hmm. that obviously receptivity, feminine energy, um, sense expression, sensuality, also creativity and intuition. It all lives in this feminine, in this energetic state, which is more in the receiving mode. Um, And a lot of the stress that I had in life was honestly, like I was bullied as a kid because boys had crushes on me. And so this idea, I know it's like, it's such a bad we one. have no idea. What a tough life, you know? Yeah. But like, but also it, I, I really, I, um, even if I did have an idea, I wasn't anything I could do to control it or stop it. And it felt like this uncomfortable force that existed in my life that interrupted my ability to have friends, either girls or boys, because something was getting messed up on either side. And the the pure child heart in me, the innocent child heart truly just wanted friends. Um, And so this thing followed me through life of, of just being like, well, maybe I change this. Maybe I try to be less you know, magnetizing or attractive, or let maybe I try to just be overtly friendly so that that, you know, and, and there was never this right concoction. The right concoction is like you at your full self and accepting, you know, yep. how that looks and being, being kind and caring of other people and their feelings. Of course, I think I, I always a- attempted to be, but what re- I realized was that I actually so withheld my sensual expression because I was so afraid of the potent force that it is. And I think, you know, the, the patriarchy does that to us too. You know, it's, we all come by it, honestly, that fear yeah. <laughs> and so burlesque and release it, you know, um, nude photography or life drawing, like all of these things that I've, I've delved into have been this freeing of my soul self. And so I've recently, it's, you know, so befitting our timing talking about this because I've know. just brought back Ophelia goodness is the, my artist name and my burlesque name. And Ophelia Goodness is now going to be what I put my music under and my shamanic soul art, this amazing art process of like doing soul portraits and like reading and healing journeys based on what's going on in people's lives. And then also my poetry, my photography, anything that comes into mind. So I've, I've already declared 2024, the year of unleashed creative expression. <laughs> I love your segues into like, literally you're going through my questions in order. <laughs> just random thoughts that I needed to throw on paper because the next question is what are you currently working on that we can get excited (laughs) about with you (laughs) well I'll list two things more specifically but since I'm basically answering that yeah yeah exactly (laughs) I'm not surprised at all Laura I think if you make a list I'm gonna answer it whether I knew it or not okay we're gonna see if you know the next question (laughs) oh gosh no put me up to the test that's funny um so I will say um, what I am creating is this empath energetics manual and this season of transformations. I love my empath energetics course and I'm knowing that it has to go to more people. And so I've got Oracle decks that go along with it that I'm really excited for in 2024. Again, 
unleash okay. expression. Um, and so that that's a beautiful project. The season of transformation, it's got the shamanic healing, an oracle work service with me and the hypnotherapy. And so it's like stuff like that in my healing work. I'm really jazzed about just being like, what's the highest level of, of offering, you know, that I can give and still yeah. be accessible to people. I really think it's so accessible. It's like 185 per month for three months of that, like epic, epic work, which I think is yeah. like unheard of. Most people are charging like 6,000 per, you know, these days in that world. Yeah. And then the other thing I'm really excited about is on the creative front, I'm creating um, an album of my ancestors poems that I've turned into songs. Um, I get songs of Montrose. And so I'm going to film it and record it next year. I'm so, so excited for it. So I'm just in the process of looking for funding and reaching out to these different societies of, you know, history preservation. And yeah, it's, beautiful. it's a really beautiful journey. Like I had this little well up from my heart into my throat and now my tongue <laughs> is all tingly. Yeah. That sounds beautiful. It is beautiful. You know, and I felt so, I feel so connected to him. Um, and there's a reason that I'm here in Scotland, you know, he was an ancestor mm -hmm. that was from Scotland many years ago. And as part of my shamanic, you know, personal work and personal study, I've been doing this pilgrimage to like reconnect with him is so amazing. Oh, no, did I answer the question? I totally did. Oh, my gosh. Oh, geez. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna read it. Who are some of the people that have influenced you to get to this point? Sir James I have to screenshot this and send it to you <laughs> afterwards. That's no edits. It's just there. That's wild. <laughs> Honestly, I I oh was so doubting that I was even gonna answer. Like I was like, oh now that we've made that joke, I'm not gonna get it. But <laughs> <laughs> no, you did. I only have two more questions. Actually, one more. One more after that. And then one with just a note to make sure that we talked about it for you. Okay, beautiful. Um <laughs> So yeah, who influences me? I so I've got funny ones for this. So I have Sir James Graham, first Marquis of Montrose. That's my ancestor. He's okay. you know, clearly a great influence. Um, I've got Einstein. Love me some Einstein, big celeb okay. crush. Yeah. Um <laughs> Einstein. <laughs> Einstein, uh, obviously a prolific thinker, um, also a prolific feeler. He's a very feeling human. Um, and I think a lot of these, you know, Tesla as well. I think a lot of our early scientists before we separated science and spirit as much before we mm -hmm. value science over spirit um they do have a lot more of that combined knowledge so it, it's yeah. from reaching back there it's sometimes that we can get a lot of clarity on what we now know and then cross-reference it right we have so much modern understanding on the science front and and spirit is so close now they, they match a lot more you know uh, a lot more regularly quantum's like yeah this makes sense <laughs> um oh, and so yeah, yeah. Fine. And I would also <laughs> say um Arlene Dickinson um if, ah. and, uh, yeah she is um she's one of the sharks on uh well yes. she's one of the dragons on Dragon's Den not shark on shark deck she's one of the dragons yeah. on Dragon's Den um but she's this uh just beautiful example I think of um a very raw you know use the word authentic I love that word she's very genuine um and she holds a lot of financial power but also a lot of like influence and she holds a lot of that without really sacrificing her like quirky self um and I really have always valued that I, I find her to be very um comforting she showed up in a journey one time actually a shamanic journey me and, me and Arlene um nice. yes those are the three people that jump to mind at the moment yeah I've had the pleasure of meeting Arlene in oh. Toronto at yeah. uh, an entrepreneurship conference and to me, what stood out to her was just her presence. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like she just has this, it's not like a hard commanding presence. It's like this soft, but yet firm, open presence exactly. that you're just like, I, I can take comfort in knowing that you got me, but yes. also that I can talk to you about anything. Yes. And she holds yeah. so much actual what we would perceive as power and, and yet it's yeah. not scary it's not confronting no. it's not threatening you know no. uh, yeah oh, oh soft and firm definitely definitely yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay you didn't segue into this one so yes. one x freak no just joking <laughs> so i do want to know just because i want to hit on this because mm -hmm. we could talk forever and i just want to make sure that we're good yeah so what were some of the hardest parts for you about getting to where you are now hmm I want to know all the dirty secrets. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, let's, let's get real, real clear. Yep. On this one. I think one of the, one of the things that first jumps out is, um, the feeling along the way of, I'm never going to figure this out. You know, I'm never going to think my way through the suffering and no one seems to have the answers for me. That mm -hmm. endless struggle was very scary for a number of years. I think it's, you know, I have goosebumps saying this because I think it's what gives me so much uh, confidence in what I do now is that for many people I can be the voice of. There are some answers over here and I'm going to help you figure out the ones we don't have answers to together. And also you have all the answers and, and that something is maybe what I would have needed to hear early on. Um, Because it was really, really difficult, really hard to feel um deep pits of internal suffering and then also to feel like I was performing and like no one even knew the depth of what I was experiencing on the inside I was like a covert uh you know emotional implosion <laughs> um a lot of people I went to college with had no idea I was having daily panic attacks I would go to the washroom just to like hyperventilate and then go back to class and I'd sleep in between just so that I could shut off the world and yet I was so helpful to people like you know residents and I was used to be a resident advisor and they used to call me guru Kate because they got so much help from me I apparently I would massage people on set and I didn't even remember that I did that. And I was like, Oh, I guess it's a surprise. I went into massage. No, Kate, you did it all the time. You know, you're always naturally doing that. But truly, I don't even I, I, I have so many gaps of memory in that time because of how internally stressed I was. So I have to say, to feel like unseen in my struggle and to feel like I was never going to get answers. That was like, I think one of the hardest, hardest experiences to have for many years, many years, that feeling of not truly being understood on that deep level. But I like that you brought up those those little subtleties. I call it the uh, purple fuzzy care bear sticky toe socks um, analogy, because when we're in the middle of all of our crap, we're basically hiding. OK, like the, we know that there's a field with some goodness and success over there. We don't know how to get there. We think it's some mystical, magical field. But yet when somebody comes into our space, and has the ability to say, I can see that you're wearing purple, fuzzy Care Bear sticky toe socks. You're like, there is no way that they guessed this. Yes. No way whatsoever. You had to have seen me. You had to have been there before in order to get that much detail. Absolutely. That's really what we're looking for when people are telling their stories, is that yeah. it's not just about you know, the, the tools, the many, many tools and the many, many titles you've gathered over the years. It's... I've been through this emotional journey and here's how I have expressed it in these many different ways because yeah. they have helped me in these many different ways. And I've taken all of those puzzle pieces that we mentioned at the beginning and I've learned how to put them together in a way that works for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the hope is that you save people some time and suffering by having gone exactly. through so much time and suffering yourself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so then here's a deeper question. Huh. Kate, do you feel today that you were the hero that you needed back in that moment of deep struggle? Yeah, I mean, I would actually say I think I met myself. I really do feel that like 20 year old um, me was dreaming of because I actually live on a retreat center now and manage a retreat center. So like okay. I was dreaming of that reality that I currently exist in now. And right mm -hmm. now I'm getting dreams that I think maybe download for the next 10 years of my life because they're like, whoa, that's really yes. far from me, but that's the woman I'd like to be. Right. Yeah. And so now that dream doesn't come in as a 10 ton weight. Whereas when I was 20, oh my gosh, I was like, that's so far from who I am now. How the heck, <laughs> yeah. how the heck am I going to get there? Right. And so I would say that higher self is such a guide for all of us. It's when we can meet them in that way where we're looking to understand them and not just intimidated by them that it becomes easier to like walk alongside and say this is me and this is me and that's me realized right now because that version of me at 50 60 you know years old is seeing me right now going that's my life that's how I got from there to here right yeah. um I love I love this um this this you know saying I, I don't know exactly how he put it but Einstein said this that um, something that brings him light in his darkest times is knowing that there are other people in the world who want a better world. 
you know, and, yep. and that thought kept me alive a lot. Like truly when I, when I was in my deeper parts of suffering was that I was like, there must be other people who feel this same level of passion for better living and anguish for reduced suffering and need to be understood and need to have their feelings make sense. Um, or, or who feel lost and then become found, you know, I, I would, I would really, I, I have put a lot of faith in the idea that there are so many people who want a better world than the one I was viewing, the one I was perceiving at that time. Right. Yeah. I just wrote about that yesterday, actually, and, and did my whole Monday morning mindfulness on that idea of feeling misunderstood yeah. because it, it relates so closely to my emotional journey, which is rejection to connection. Like yes. I want to make sure I identify the specific emotions. Cause if I say that I'm stressed, I could give you thousands of tools for that. If I say that I'm feeling rejected, I could have five. It's Absolutely. just so much less overwhelming when I can be specific. So Absolutely. that's where I want to move conversations. But I was writing about this idea of feeling misunderstood because that is the idea of feeling disconnected. And really that disconnection is with the self. And so again, I'm rejecting the self. And then I was like, oh, I'm feeling misunderstood by other people because I'm misunderstanding myself. Yes. What mind trip. <laughs> you no, know, it's so funny. You're reading my mind, Laura, because I was just saying in my head, oh, you know what? Another wound that I'd like to list as to how, you know, what, how did I get there to here and what, what was actually going on? Um, I just recently addressed this this summer in a really powerful shamanic ceremony is this idea of self abandonment. Right. And I have done a talk on disconnection to greater connection. How anytime Aww. we disconnect, anytime we leave this realm, I now come yeah. back with greater connection to this earthly realm because I've got messages. And that was happening even at the time without me realizing. But that fear of self abandonment was so thick and so pervasive in so many aspects of life. And self abandonment shows up in many ways. We act like not ourselves whenever we leave ourselves. And so, how does that look in all the different colorful ways we can decide <laughs> to live our yeah. lives? Of course. And and so, self abandonment, disconnection, rejection of self. This is all like I think it, it plagues so many of us. And yet, when we don't nail it right on the head, when we don't stare it in the face, it continues to evade us right? Because we're running from it. And what a painful thing to run from yourself on a soul level. It's one of the harshest things you can do is leave yourself. Well, that's, that's where that clarity comes in, right? Absolutely. The purple fuzzy camera station. <laughs> I know those my purple props. socks so well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's the being brave enough. I call it courageous connection. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's being brave enough to look at that old version of ourselves as they are in that moment without trying to change anything yes. and looking at old Kate or old Laura or old viewer and saying, I love that version of me unconditionally. Nothing right. needs to change, but I'm here for when you're ready. Cause we, we can have emotions, but staying in an uncomfortable or an unhealthy emotion is not okay. Mm -hmm. Having it is perfectly fine. Staying there forever is not. So when you're ready to move up the scale, I'm here for you. But until then, we'll just sit. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Then there's less running when you're sitting. Hey, there's there's so much it. less running. <laughs> I We've talked about this in the Blue Talks, the last Amplify Your Message event, where sometimes we have to tell ourselves, okay, Laura, you're feeling really crappy right now. You've got 15 minutes to give yourself a pity party. Mm -hmm. Then it's done. Mm -hmm. Then it's over with. Then you move on. Yes. You can be as pitiful to yourself as you want in those 15 minutes. Let it all out. Yeah. And you it know, it feels so good. And the smartest thing I think in that the, the wisest thing truly is that it's let it all out. Like let it actually be all, you know, rather yeah. than often we, we are so afraid of what the bottom of the barrel, yeah. bottom of the well, deepest part of the ocean is going to look like or feel like, I know that's like probably half of what created anxiety and PTSD, all these types of things, all these labels that, that were going on in my life, because yeah. it's like, I was so afraid of that discomfort, what that discomfort might mean, how it might change things, what other people might think if I'm actually letting myself have that, that it was so withheld, that withheld was this push pull force that kept it with me. Right. I was hearing one of my clients talked about, like, I've just got to let this go. And I called her out, you know, lovingly. <laughs> 
lovingly call up, I call it instead of call out. Oh, I like <laughs> call it. Call up to your to yourself, you know, to to your your higher evolution. Truly, it was a call up to say, if you're choosing to let go of something, it means you're clinging to it, right? If you say you've got to let go of something, every time you show up to a session, you say you have to let go of a thing. I'm I'm just calling BS on that right now, right? Because that's you saying, I've got this thing. I've got this thing I need to let go of. <laughs> I remember being so angry every time people would tell me, I'll just let go, just let go. Like, but how? How do I let go? Useless advice. You know what I say? Invite in, call in what it is you'd like. That stuff just drops away. All the stuff you didn't want to hold on to, you know, you're just not going to have room for it if you've got all the, it's like someone gives you a cake. You're going to drop your bag of apples that you didn't really care about, right? (laughs) Like I'm taking that cake, whatever it is. On the cake. Like if it's a pound cake, I'm definitely dropping the apples. If it's right. a normal cake, I'm probably keeping the apples. Honestly, I love apples actually. So I should have yeah. used some other example, but <laughs> you like those those molasses Halloween candies. We're just oh gonna drop God. all of those. Drop those before anyone even hands me a cake. Who made those? Honestly. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Kate, I wanna I wanna dive back into the emotions that we were just playing with there for a moment of that anger like these things are not okay this is kind of making me mad pissing me off extending my boundaries to places that I'm uncomfortable so what is it that makes you angry about the work that you do Hmm. because it's tied to your message so we'll do that after. it's true no it's true um and so interesting because uh for many years I would say constantly when I was a kid I'd say I don't have anger uh, it just skips right over to sadness. I'd say I don't yeah. have, anger. but I really realized later on, um, no fault of my parents. Obviously they wanted a peaceful household, but I think I just never felt anger was going to be received well, or that I didn't know how it could be expressed. And then, you know, I, I dated a lot of men who had anger issues, surprisingly, just so I could experience <laughs> what's huh. anger. And I got a, a full encyclopedia understanding of what that looks like. And then was able to tap into my own. I, I love this idea of sacred rage. The stuff that I am annoyed about is the stuff that fuels me. And the stuff that I feel charged about is the stuff that gives me the energy and the life force to go and, and help the world. And so, you know, what annoyed me and frustrated me about the empath and highly sensitive community was the amount of like blaming others for their own experience. That really frustrated me. So I built a whole program to bring people back to themselves so that they, that's not a risk anymore. That's not a factor. And then, you know, they don't have tools to protect themselves. Well, here you go. You don't need to protect yourself if you feel full energy, actually. You know, you then beam out so much that you're not really worried about how other people influence you. And so that is something that really frustrated me. Yeah. There's injustices in the world. I think, you know, that are this sacred rage stuff that actually really upsets me stuff with children really upsets me. I know I'm here to help children. I had this vision come through recently this summer of um, an orphanage in Madagascar of all places. I've never been to Madagascar. It's like so wild that this has opened up. It made so much sense to me because I've felt this frustration for, and frustration's not, it's way too light of a word. Um, for injustices against children and for injustices on you know, how, how do we get this luxury spice of vanilla and yet the, it's like one of the poorest countries and they have so much crime and there's sex trafficking and there's you know there's there's no way that that makes sense in my head and yet we cannot solve all the issues of the world we've got to go to the ones that our specific soul and spirit is meant to go towards otherwise as sensitive people we get weighed the heck down which is why a lot of sensitive people can't handle the news because they are exposed to all of it and they feel powerless, right? That's the opposite, right? I feel power when I think it's possible I can make a difference in one aspect of the world and that comes in clear to me because I'm mad that that exists. It brings up so many emotions. You can tell I'm speaking (laughs) more like- Oh yeah, no, that's where I wanted to go. Yes. Absolutely. And so it's these sacred rage things that actually have to be expressed. And, And yet, just like you said, it's so uncomfortable to hold things and, and have that feeling bubble and set and stagnate. And so we do need a lot of movement. I think, I think physical movement allows us to like channel yes. uh, and do something with this energy. So it doesn't stay stuck somewhere or feeling stuck somewhere. That's exactly where I wanted to, to take this is I wanted to highlight that it's okay for us to be angry as human beings, as well as business owners. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're, we're, we have this perception of what professionalism is. Don't have emotions. Bullcrap. 
<laughs> Emotions are what drive meaning behind the logic and the data and the transactions that we make. Absolutely. To me, heart-centered business is, is human beings helping other human beings to be the human beings that they want to become. Mm -hmm. So without emotions, how do we know where to place meaning? Absolutely. How do we know it's important for somebody and not important for somebody else? And I don't emotions think really give us clarity. Decisions. Right? And we <laughs> don't make decisions without emotion, do we? We like to think exactly it's logic, but we really do. We feel it and then we make a decision. Oh, we feel it. And, and that's how we weigh the logic. Faith. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and all our faith comes after we make a decision, right? We exactly. make a decision and then our confidence is like, okay, now that we've made that decision, better buck up and believe in it. <laughs> yeah. So now that we've highlighted the things that make you angry, how mm -hmm. do you, I'm going to use a, a word I'm working with lately. How do you transmute or shift or adjust or up level that energy into something that is now your momentum is now your power into the message that you have? I dance, I create, I sing, <laughs> yeah. um, and I connect with my guides, truly, truly. Yeah. When I am stuck staring at a wall, just not sure what to do, and and I feel like I, I, I don't know how to shift this, or I, I feel in that, oh my gosh, you know, I'm stuck in this kind of cir circle of energy. Uh, I go and ask my guides, what am I supposed to do about this thing? You know, what is that pointing me to? Um, you know, I, I visit a, an, an animal, a, a power animal, or I receive guidance from ancestors who have passed on, or I sing to bring joy back into my body and recall what that feels like. You know, I had a client tell me recently because I decided to open with a song before I did this talk um, on going in circles when healing, actually, which is really funny. Yeah. Um, and, and I was, you know, I opened with this song and she said, wow, I just felt so much joy in like my heart and my throat. And I said, well, that's what I'm feeling. So it makes a lot of sense. I work with sensitive beings. They're all going to feel, you know, what everyone else is and dance again, dance. I think, especially for the rage, especially for the stuff that, um, is feeling like it is beyond words, anything that's beyond words, I think movement dance, freeing your body. I'm actually committing. It's hilarious that we're talking about this because I'm committing to a daily dance back to my soul back to my soul self practice um yeah and it'll be on my Ophelia goodness uh my my Ophelia goodness page and, and works that way because nice. I think it's so critically important that's what shamans always used to say when was the last time you danced and sung that was how they knew if you were well or not truly I would definitely agree first I have a friend of mine who does um dancing meditations uh, I love her energy. She just like, she's making you free flow and you're just like, I'm so nervous. No, she, her energy just really grounds you and you just wiggle. It's great. Yes, exactly. And for me, power vocals mm -hmm. are the thing that I love. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I haven't sung any sort of power vocals in my house or out of my house, then I, I get pretty sad or depressed really quickly. Yes. Yes. Because I know for me, I use it as a part of my vagus nerve stimulation. Absolutely. I have my own process that I, I created. And then singing is a part of that for me. Has to be. Yeah. yeah. Vibrational healing at its finest. So how oh, yeah. vagus nerve. We are of the same mind. Oh, I know. <laughs> I was like, where did I go from? I went from like Chantel to Adele and there was some Sia in there. And yes. then, oh, oh, Lizzie Hale. Yes. Yeah all mm -hmm. kinds of sounds just oh, so good yeah so then kate what if, if you could kind of like dwindle down your message into something tangible that people could easily share what would your message be radical deep transformation is entirely attainable through receptivity and personal responsibility Ooh, that last part the personal responsibility oops gotta take that no, too no <laughs> i love that you're just like here is this truth with this extra layer of truth to it that may hurt a little but it just like it's so wrapped up in each other that you need to do both it's it's difficult to just say be be receptive if you don't take responsibility for the ways you are not yeah yeah, I did an interview with Dr. Joe Vitale, mm -hmm. and from there, I was inspired to read his book, Zero Limits. Mm -hmm. Like, I had heard about it, and I was just like, ah, whatever. 
when I read the book for the first time, I finally realized why now was the time for me. I didn't have the understanding before that interview to know what the book was talking about on that deeper level, like surface level, I would have got it. I would have read it, probably would have put it on my shelf, never thought about it again. But getting to that point meant that I could look at the subtleties since we mentioned that. I could look at the deeper truth since we mentioned that to really have a transformational experience. And my, my takeaway was, of course, I thought about it logically. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, how do I math this up if we're going to go Einstein level? So if if you are pissing me off, let's just say you made me angry, Kate, which I don't think is going to happen, but let's just say it happened. Okay, then it is my job to create zero limit between us. So for those who are visual learners like me, just imagine like there's a rope between you and me. You're pissing me off so much. You're taking that energy, that much energy from me and you're tied to me. That's where all of those, you know, cord cutting things mm -hmm. come from. And I'm like, okay, what if it's math? What if on a scale of one to 10, you're pissing me off at a nine? That's some good work <laughs> and, <I've> so, <laughs> and so I'm showing up in life at a nine. Then it's my job to have that cord as a multiplier because that's what happens. So nine times nine is 81. Oh my God, life is crazy at that point. Mm -hmm. But if I bring myself down to a zero, where I forgive myself, give myself grace, and then say, you know, I'm not going to focus on this anymore. It is what it is. I'm done putting energy here. I'm a zero. So zero times anything is zero. <laughs> it's like, that makes so much sense. So now, like, I see these things, as you were talking about empaths being affected by people all the time. I see these things, the news, all of that. And I just imagine that math with the cord and I'm like, nope, zero multiplier. I'm a zero. <laughs> exactly. Get me to zero. I'll be okay. Yeah. And and I putting that. care into the things that your soul and spirit is meant to be here for putting that care into and doing something about it rather than, yeah. you know, stirring in that, yeah, stirring in that yeah. swimming in that nothingness where it feels like, you know, powerless. That uh, there's no there's no point in doing that for any longer than it already happens to us. But without that awareness and without that deeper truth, we can never get to that zero. And you know what? That's what other people are for, to help us see the different perspectives and facets of who we are. So Don't I just want to nervous. thank you on behalf of everybody watching. And of course, Blue Talks, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for being the type of person that you are and helping people the way that you want to help them. So thank you. Thank you. It, Back at you, allowing people to be their true self and, and shine forward. And I, I just love your style in um, you. You truly are a very receptive interviewer and in that you'll be so curious and so passionate about exploring, you know, the depth of who that person is as well. It's a necessary thing in this world. I have two more questions before we go. I just, right. these are some of my favorite. I always like to end with, okay, what would be crazy cool? Not logical. I'm thinking like genie snaps its fingers. Crazy cool. What would be crazy cool to happen for you in the next year? What would be crazy cool to happen crazy in the next cool. year? Um, mm -hmm. Would be running retreats um, that feel like when people leave them, they feel like they've been reborn. And that's no small feat. It's something I'm no. up to task for. I love the idea of doing a couple's retreat where the couple leaves feeling like they are new people and stronger together. Like, I love that feeling of yeah. watching people in that full self-realization. So through retreat, you know, getting to travel, I mean, for all people involved, that would be crazy cool next year. Okay, so everybody listening, <laughs> you're thinking, <laughs> how can I help Kate make this a reality? How can we work together? Where are the collaborations? That's what I love. So then the final question is, where do we find you? I guess it's twofold. And what is your favorite way of communicating? Yeah, so you can find me at heartsfrontier.com um, on Instagram, I'm Shamanic Oracle Kate. TikTok, I'm Shamanic Oracle, but also Ophelia Goodness uh, on both of those platforms. On uh, YouTube, I'm Hearts Frontier, and I will be doing Ophelia Goodness stuff. She exists, but she's just real quiet on YouTube at the moment. <laughs> and um, my favorite way of connecting to people, you know, I am a 
true blue typical millennial where I'm just like, you know, any way you fly in, I can kind of handle, um, you know, I, I can't always take a call, but that's because we live full lives. But uh, I love actually any, any way, email, message, Facebook, Instagram, you know, if someone sent me a pigeon, I'd be so excited. I really would. I have be. a friend so, of mine that may yeah. be able to do that. Oh my gosh. If you could hook that up, that'd be another cool thing to have happen in 2024. Oh. So pigeon mail. <laughs> bring it back <laughs> that would be good. I may have I'll talk to her and see what's possible <laughs> you know you know a guy for pigeons <laughs> so crazy and I love it okay uh this has been a delight an absolute delight and as Corey likes to say I would love to call this a to be continued yes absolutely. yes <laughs> happily happily to be happily. continued I just, I want to give you some space at the end here to just say anything that you wanted to get off your chest. Maybe you had additional comments just so that you have some space for you. Hmm. I appreciate that. Um, I'd really just like to say to anyone who is at this point in the interview, thank you so much and, and take some of my loving heart energy into your day. Take a moment for yourself to feel into anything that came up for you as you were listening. And um, if anyone does feel called or connected to my energy, I would love to connect in whatever way that leads us.